to order, to order, uh, order, 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 voting, 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 Testing. It's not here this time. It was the mayor's microphone. Test one, two, three. Okay, I just wanted to thank you all for being here today so I could go over our election practices. And I chose to do this now because we had so much going on last year with elections. I brought forward legislation and then asked you not to pass it. So I wanted to give you an update on where we're at, where we're going, and why we needed to make changes. So I am going to share my screen. There we go. Okay. So, first of all, we work up. Got to change the slide. So, our current election practices, we work very closely with the borough to, to conduct our elections. And the reason that we do this is we have 3,700 shared voters. So, they're entitled to vote in not just the city election, but they also get to vote in the borough election. And we want to make sure that we're informing those voters about both election in a quality, very comprehensive way so that everything runs smoothly for the voters. Our goal is to make the process as seamless as possible. A lot of times the voter doesn't recognize that it's two separate elections going on, which means we've successfully done our job. Um, part of that is a really convenient process that we have done for years is our voters get to go to one location, stand in one line, sign two registers, get both of their ballots, vote them, vote them, and then run them through the same machine. And we continue to do this. It's been a great relationship with the borough, and we're glad that we're continuing on this way. That's also a lot of the reason why I brought forward that other legislation last summer is because the borough was potentially changing. And as long as we have an election on the same day for the same voters, it would make sense that we followed with what the borough is doing. So that is why we do it. Is there any questions about why we work with the borough so closely to do this? Okay. So what we do. There's a lot that goes into an election. Like I'm already starting to, to work into the election stuff, but you, nobody will notice until July when we start advertising our candidate filing period. 
Um, there are three required, required notices for an election, our notice of vacancy, voter registration, and notice of election. We are by law required to publish each one of those notices a certain time before the event happens in a newspaper of general circulation. And um, the, the timing and the, a number of times. We go above and beyond. We always publish additionally in the newspaper, but we also post it on the city website, the Facebook feed, the bulletin boards at City Hall, and the bulletin boards at the public library. The information about our election specific is also included in the voter pamphlet. Um, the notice of vacancy that we advertise, that identifies the seats that are coming up on our future election. So we do that advertising independently on our own because it's just the city elections that we're, we're promoting there. And the openings coming up in the borough does there separately and so do the other cities. Our voter registration notice, we have to publish 60 days before the election and that's because voters need to update their information at least 30 days before the election. We actually... The clerks before me and the current Kenai clerk started doing this one together so we could publish more and share the expense. So we actually published that one a few more times than is, re than is required. And then our next is the notice of election, which that tells our voters what seats. On that notice, we don't put the candidates. That information is in the voter pamphlet. But the voter, the notice of election tells you what seats are up for election. If we have any propositions, the, the language that will be on the ballot for those propositions or referendums. And that information is also in the borough's pamphlet. And we go to the next. So what we have next is how our ballots get created. So our candidate filing period runs August 1st through the 15th annually, with an exception if the 15th falls on a Saturday or Sunday, then it closes the Monday following at noon. After the candidate filing period closes, I get all of the information to the borough clerk so she can start programming the memory cards and laying out the ballots for that election. The reason we are in... Getting that done quickly is because it takes time for the printers to get the ballots printed and back to us. So if there is a proposition from the city council, that ordinance placing that question on the ballot has to be enacted 53 days prior to the election for the same purpose. We have to have that question ready to go to the printer as soon as possible. And the same timeline would apply to a citizen's referendum or initiative. They would have to get the process started earlier that if the referendum or rep initiative were certified, that we could get it on the ballot for that election. It's actually in our city code, in our election code, that establishes that 53-day You couldn't make it shorter and have it actually printed on the ballot. Um, that, that printing timeline is, is part of a lot of that. So once the ballots are laid out by the borough clerk, she sends me a proof that I get the final approval to make sure everything's okay, where I review all of my candidate. Everybody's told me how they want their name on the ballot and all of the proposition language. And then I approve the ballots after we work out any, any corrections. Once that's done, the ballot order is placed by the borough clerk for regular elections. Um, this has a lot to do with both of our elections, the two separate elections, are put on one memory card in one machine. So she has all of the layouts and she can transmit that file to our printer who prints the ballots. Our, we have two separate ballots. The borough and the city ballot do not are two separate, very separate ballots, but it can go into the same machine. Uh, once the ballots come back from the printer, they are delivered to the borough clerk's office. And from there, they are tested by a citizen, by two separate citizen review boards. So every time there's a ballot type printed, so for us, there's generally just one ballot type. Um, for the borough, they can have... 25 or more ballot types, depending on service area board races and whatnot. So every ballot type, there is a test deck printed. This test deck is clearly watermarked that it's a test deck. And we have review boards that come in and vote those ballots in a pattern. And how it works is the first oval on the ballot is voted once, the second oval is voted twice, two separate ballots with the second oval filled in. 
third, same three, so that we can logically predict what the outcome of this test election is going to be. The first board comes in and runs the test. They know what their results are going to be based on, on the test deck and the number of ovals on those ballots. Once they get those results, they certify that they got those results, seal the memory card and their findings and their result tapes in an envelope. That's when a whole different review board comes in, opens that, runs another test, the exact same test on the exact same test deck, and they are, their goal is to get the same results. Once they get those results, they certify that they got the same results, and they take that memory card, put it in the voting AccuVote machine, and put a seal over it that has a serial number, and they make a certified document for the election board that runs the election that day, telling them that that memory card was sealed by them, the logic and accuracy testing was completed, the results were correct, and this is the number that it was sealed with. So when the election board gets there that morning, they have verified that that seal number is the same, knowing that the last person that touched that was the Citizens Review Board that, that tested the, the election. Is there any question about that process? Because that's one of those that most people don't realize we're doing in the background. No, yeah, no. like I said, as long as the test deck has been voted properly, we can predict what the outcome of the election is going to be, and the two, two boards get the same result, and then it's, that card is sealed in the vote and put in election mode for election day. And then the next people that touch it is another citizen hired the election officials for the precinct that day. I do. It would depend on, on the, I mean, this process works very well. We, before I would say that something would be inadequate, I would need to see the full scope of what the plan would be. So that is how our ballots are created. I also want to note that the ballot custody is a big deal. When, so the ballots, I, I don't know if any of you have ever noticed, but when you vote a ballot, they're on a tear, and that top tear has a number on it. When the ballot is handed to a voter, it's taken off and that number is separated, so we don't know what number ballot you got, but we do know that tear number one ballot is missing. So when the ballots are delivered from the printer to the borough clerk, she audits the ballots and makes sure that all the ballots that she's supposed to get are there. And then when I go pick them up, I again audit them. Once I get them, I do ballot receipts for our absentee voting in person office, our absentee voting in mail, and those officials that get those ballots then again audit and make sure they get all of the ballots that I said they, they are supposed to get. So through this whole process, we are accounting for every ballot. If a ballot's missing, we have a signature and a register or an application for a by mail that goes with the missing ballot. So at the end of it, we can tell you where all of the ballots went. We can't tell you which number or how the voter did, but we do know where all of the ballots went. So, any questions? So, our absentee voting. So, our voters have three options for voting absentee. They can abs vote by mail or electronic transmission, which is fax, or they can vote absentee in person. So, sorry. The by mail or electronic, in order to get a ballot mailed or sent electronically, the voter has to complete an application. This application is the voter's information, how they want to receive it, and it does include the voter has to provide an identifier, which we confirm with their voter registration through the state of Alaska. Um, currently, there's two separate applications. We have the city of Soldan application that the voter will only get a city ballot. The borough, however, has a place on their application where the voter can vote that they want a city ballot as well, and the borough then sends us those. 2020, the borough, sorry. The borough um, instituted an online absentee ballot application process. And if we continue to do this, we, the, we did some work last year to get through it because of COVID. But if we continue to do this, I'm going to need to make revisions to our city code that allows us to accept electronically submitted applications for absentee ballot, which I'm doing a thorough review of our code to see if there's any other changes that we need to make. A voter that wants a application a ballot mailed to them has to get us their application at least seven days before the election. And this is, gives us time to 
get the ballot in the mail to them and time for them to mail it back if they don't want to drop it off. A voter that wants an electronic transmitted ballot needs to get it to me at least the day before. And their F oath that they sign, they are also, it also indicates that they understand that we will do our best ability to keep their vote confidential. But if it comes in face up on my fax machine, I don't look and I fold it and try not to notice. But that because it's coming through a fax and not in a sealed envelope, I have to take the best steps I can to do that. So that's, that's but it's clear to the voters who want to vote by fax that that's, a, that's part of the process. Um, we have, so on a normal election year, probably at least 20 of our absentee voters out of the 50 um, do by fax. Last year, I did not even keep up with the numbers because we had more than three times our normal absentee voters. So, But there is, there's a few that do it. And then, so, and then there's the absentee in person. The absentee in person site opens two weeks before election day. For regular elections, it's at the borough building right across the street. And for the special elections, we have it here at City Hall. Um, we actually have created this really cute cart that's AV on, AVO on the go because Breck, the deputy, handles it. And we, we, we don't want to sit in the chambers all day when there's not a voter. So we have this little cart that stays in the vault and comes up with us when we have it. Somebody that wants to vote. I would like to state that during regular elections, most city clerk's offices also serve as an absentee voting office. So Kenai, Homer, Seward, Kachemak, Saldovia, they do. The reason Saldana doesn't is our proximity to the borough building. It would not make sense to have two voting places right next door to each other. So current process for a person who votes in absentee uh, requires that if the voter wants to vote in both the city and the borough election, if any of you have done absentee in person, you would recognize this form. They have to do one for both of our elections, uh, one for the borough and one for the city. They vote their ballot, and then the corresponding voted ballot goes in the envelope for the borough, to the borough's office for canvassing later, and to the city. I'm working on an idea that I've worked out some kinks that I'm hoping that we can make this process a little easier for the voters one form, two envelopes, but there's a few other things that I need to fix before we do that. And so let's see. Those ballots that are put in these envelopes, they stay in there until the end of election day when all of the returns are done. And for the city of Saldana, our canvas board canvases the Tuesday following the election. And they, they don't open these, I'll go more into Canvas, until they've verified that the voter was eligible to vote that and didn't vote in another, no, any other method during that election. So any question on those? Absentee voting. So, election. Yes. Um, one thing you'll hear about in some cases is the drive through and mail. Do you have any sense of how many ballots come in after the deadline? So, for example, if you send in your ballot, it kind of comes out there each week, but obviously it has to be voted you know, before the election day itself. But do you have any sense of how many ballots come in afterwards, and particularly, do you have any sense? So in military ballots, I, since becoming the city clerk, I haven't seen one. There's generally at least one that comes in after. So the thing with the by fax, that ballot has to be received in my office on my fax machine by the close of the polls on election day. By mail, it has to be postmarked election day and received before the Canvas Board meets on Tuesday. So the Canvas Board actually holds until the mail comes in on Tuesday and then make sure there's no more. And I think last year we actually only received one after and and we do have a few military voters. So. And they are usually ahead of schedule and we get those, you know, they, they've applied ahead of time and we get those out as soon as possible. So with the election officials, we do uh, work closely with the borough to recruit our election officials. 
These people are your neighbors, your friends. You recognize their faces when you go in to vote. They, they do this tirelessly every year. Um, during regular elections, they are hired by the borough clerk's office. And once the election is concluded, they invoice us for half of the election worker cost. During special elections, we hire them by the city. We do all of the recruitment here. They are, like I said, the, they're amazing people. They make our elections successful. The absentee um, official administers the absentee in-person voting location. The by mail is administered here in our, in our facility. Um, our election board are the people that run the polling site on election day. And our canvas board, when the canvas meets, that is a public process. Um, it, and it is open. The canvas board canvases our results at the borough building, and that's because on election day, everything, we share a canvas board with the borough, and everything gets bundled up and sent to the borough. It would not make sense to go bring it back and then make them change buildings as they go through it. So it all takes place for regular elections at the borough building and here for special elections. Whoops, that was the wrong button. There we go. So our equipment. <laughs> The uh, current election equipment that we have been using up to this point was purchased by the state of Alaska, and they have allowed us to use it. Um, so all of your ballot boxes, optical scan units, and voting booths are, are actually belong to the state. The optical scan units, when we're not using and when the state's not using, have been stored at the borough clerk's office. And the ballot boxes are actually stored, they were stored at City Hall, and when we moved our location to the library, there's the library is keeping those in the, the basement. So we know where they are, we're ready to go. One of the things to keep in mind is the current equipment that we've been using has been in place with updated s since 1998. So the, the state of Alaska last year purchased and implemented new equipment. Um, I'll give you a little more detail in the next section as to why they did that and why it's needed. Uh, election day, as you know, in 2020, we moved the precinct to the Soldatna Public Library. That was a huge success. The voters loved it. The library staff loved it. There was room for people to come in out of the cold. The, the regular election is October. It's not quite as cold, but November, the general election is pretty cold. So it was very great success. Um, when a voter comes into the precinct, they show ID, and at this time, they sign, if they're a city voter, they have to sign two registers, the borough register and the city register. The voter registers that are signed are maintained by the Division of Elections, State of Alaska, and they send us those for each election. Uh, prior to 2013, here's just some history. Voters, when they came to vote in Soldatna, only had to file, sign one register, and that was because the Soldatna precinct, which is designated by the state of Alaska, boundaries matched the city limit boundaries. So in 2010, through the census and redistricting process, those boundaries were matched once again. However, in 2012, the state of Alaska Supreme Court rejected the plan, and in 2013, a new plan was adopted. That new plan grew the Soldatna precinct boundaries, not the city boundaries in any way, but then the Soldatna precinct now included roughly a 1,000 voters that did not live in city limits. So how we determine when somebody walks through the door here to vote if they're entitled to a city ballot is if they're on the city register. If they're not on the city register and still insist that they are a city resident, they can vote a provisional ballot, which we call a question ballot, which is the same envelope in yellow. And... If they were on neither register, we would try to find out what precinct they, they should be voting in because it's not the same ballot in every precinct. And they could be entitled to questions that aren't on our, aren't on our ballot. If they don't want to go find their location, we will allow them to vote provisional ballots here. Never, we never tell anybody they can't vote. We tell them they can vote a provisional ballot. So that brings us to the Canvas Board. So we already covered that they meet on the Tuesday following the election, and they canvass at City Hall for, yeah, we did a lot of that already, sorry. So what they're looking for is they're making sure the voter was in fact entitled to that voter, which meant they were registered in the area for that ballot at least 30 days before the election. 
and that they did not vote in any other way in the same election. So this is why it's after the fact because all of the questioned absentees and regular registers are in one location. And when they, the Canvas Board is reviewing the information on these envelopes, they can compare all of those registers and make sure that voter didn't sign somewhere else and get another ballot. If the voter was entitled to the ballot, that's when the ballot comes out of here. They, the ballots are put on that secrecy sleeve. If any of you have done that, it's just a secrecy sleeve that it goes in there. The ballot and the secrecy sleeve are separated so that when that ballot is actually pulled and ran for the tally, nobody knows who voted it because it's been separated from this already. If the voter was not entitled to receive the ballot, the Canvas Board sends them a letter indicating why it wasn't counted whether it was you were in the wrong precinct, you weren't registered in time, there's several reasons. And then that envelope is never opened and it's stored in my vault for five years according to our retention schedule before we can destroy it. If the voter is identified as voting twice, they receive the letter from the Canvas Board indicating they voted twice, I also call them to identify if the voter was aware that they voted twice and also to let them know that I will be forwarding the record of the double voting and our conversation to the state of Alaska Attorney General who will further investigate the matter. Sorry. So once the Canvas Board is finished with all of that, they combine the Canvas totals with the totals from election night and put their report together that I attach to a resolution that you certify for the election. And... That's that part. Is there any questions on those? No. We don't. So why do we need to change? There's a few reasons. The Help America Vote Act, which was signed into law in 2002 by President Bush, um, had provisions about the American with Disabilities Act, and those are, are the... ADA compliance is the primary reason, and 21 years of equipment use. This stuff is, is getting worn out. We have a lot more misfeeds when you vote. If you've ever had your ballot kicked back, this is because it's really old equipment. And according to the, the information in the borough clerk's office, there is no longer support for the software or the equipment available. So. It's, it's had its life. Actually, yes. I, so I'm putting some election history together, and it looks like the first time we had the scan unit ballots was in 1998. So we've been using this for that long. It's held up pretty well. So the Help America Vote Act. It was signed, I already did. The law encouraged the states to replace punch card and lever voting machines by providing funding for replacement and required, in part, the administration of election for federal office, that's the key there, to provide voters with impaired vision or hearing the ability to cast secret ballots and that polling locations and voting machines were accessible to the voters with physical disabilities. Sorry. And I would like to point out that that was brought into law in 2002 in the state of Alaska in 1998 had implemented the changes already. And if any of you remember why I do, I remember the, the hanging chads. <laughs> so... Uh, so, and the, the primary, so I will read this, um, have I also included requirements to provide physical access for individuals with disabilities, providing non-visual access to individuals with visual, with visual impairment, and providing language assistance for individuals with limited proficiency in English. So th this is the big thing, is letting the voters with disability vote independently. And that, that's a lot of why we're where we're at, which is the ADA compliance. 
So in 2015, a complaint was filed with the Alaska State Commission for Human Rights regarding the KPV voting accommodations for the visually impaired. In October of 2018, a conciliation agreement was approved by the Executive Director of the Alaska Commission for Human Rights, which identified in part the following, adoption of a non-discrimination policy, exploring accessible voting options, and establishing a stakeholders group to explore options and providing assistive technology, and to determine feasibility of each option. In January 2019, the election stakeholder group was formed by KPB resolution and included City Manager Queen, Council Member Tyson Cox, and I also served as an expert advisor to this. I wasn't a voting member. Uh, the group met twice monthly from February 2019 through July of 2019. And it consisted of not just our representation, it had the managers from each city, an elected official from each city, and the clerks from all the cities within the Kenai Peninsula Borough. The, in July of 2019, the group adopted their final recommendations, and the number one recommendation would have, the, would have had the highest impact on the city, and that was to transition from a polling site structure to a vote-by-mail hybrid structure. And we all know where that went. Uh, in, 2020, the keep, in June of 2020, the Assembly enacted an ordinance that would have done that. However, uh, in the election of 2020, in the October election of 2020, the voters repealed that law. So that brought us back to a standard polling location type election. So why do we need to improve? Well, the election equipment is very old and is not ADA compliant. The current AccuVote system does not have, sorry, the current system was the state's. However, the borough had purchased the software necessary to program the local elections. And then I did touch on the current legislation before the assembly explains that there is no longer support for the software or the equipment. And with 21-year-old equipment, you're, you're, you're chanting it not coming through a full day of election. I'm doing a little fast. So what's next? The current process we have no expected changes. Um, we'll have ADA compliant equipment available. Uh, there will be notice, no changes in how we are noticing elections, our candidate filing period, or the ballot programming and testing process. Absentee voting methods will stay the same, and so will our election official recruitment. Polling location is going to stay at the Soldatna Library since that was such a great uh, opportunity and our canvas board procedures will not change. There will be the new ADA compliant equipment available. And that is pretty much it. So I am open for any questions. No questions? Um, have a, that had a disability of some sort. There were people in a wheelchair, maybe people on a, in a walker, um, and I think they felt bad, you know, trying to go to the front of the line. But there certainly wasn't. It was chaos a little bit in there, as all are, are all elections. But it, is there a responsibility when we run an election to have, you know, an option for? those persons with a disability to sort of get first access to voting in person? Or is that maybe the design of the hybrid male in voting is that those individuals should be 
mailing it in. But then that seems discriminatory as well. It would be up to the voter. We just need to okay. ensure that the the uh, voters with disabilities have the same equal rights as voters without disabilities as far as access. So if they choose to vote from home by mail or electronic transmission, that is their choice. Or if they want to go to the polling site, we need to ensure that they have the same capabilities. Okay. Um, yeah, what, what would change, I didn't see that mentioned at all, in our polling locations then to maybe accommodate? I mean, obviously people with disabilities can enter the facility, can vote, but it seems maybe that it would be a barrier if it's a long wait, particularly for people that, you know, might have either health concerns or mobility concerns. Correct. So, in, in, like you said, in the, the library, they, they accommodated with seating as they as ran through the line. But same, it's the access. We need to ensure that they can access it and, you know, there are no additional requirements for ensuring they go to the head of the line. There is the two weeks prior absentee voting in person that they can do or, or other methods of their choice. But if they go to the polling location, it's the same line for everybody. Any other questions? On a little bit of the campaign a while ago, but you know, have you had any difficulty recruiting or, or recampaigning people in the last couple of days? There, so generally that question, if it if the voter was asked to refrain and they refused, I would be called into the situation. So that has only happened once. And it was a sign on a car in the parking lot, and the voter did not want to cover it up. Um, however, yes, it is. We post it all over that there is no campaigning within 200 feet of a polling location. And, and for the most part, people comply. They forget they have the pin on or the hat on. And when you point it out, they usually take it care of it very quickly. Um, so Shelly, so it, the system that you described to us today, I don't know if everyone is even aware that that is the process that goes on behind the scenes and it sounds pretty secure to me um, so I guess my question is what can we as a council or a city do to make sure that that information about the security of our elections is getting out because there has been a lot of talk this past year about the safety of elections and I think if more people knew what happened actually in their community there wouldn't be as much of the the rhetoric around that elections. was a lot to do with this presentation I wanted to to make sure that you guys were aware of it if a voter is questioning it by all means you can give them my number I'll be glad to talk them through the process anytime and this will be out available for streaming on our, our website for for a long time so any other outward you know outreach to the community just I, I have a feeling that this idea that elections are not fair, not safe, not secure, I think that that idea is going to be around for a little while now, and it seems like the vote by mail is is also going to be around, maybe not necessarily here, but if we still are having concerns with the pandemic and during our next election, I mean, those two things don't seem like they're going to go away anytime soon, and it just seems like it's a situation that could benefit from some additional education for our residents. Yeah, it, it's unfortunate. Um, for us locally, one of the things to just let people know is is for a person to get an absentee by mail ballot here at this time, they have to fill out an application, and that application requires an identifier. The returned ballot also requires on the outside of it, the envelope in a secure area that's concealed another identifier of the voter. So we are verifying that the voter that asked for the ballot is the same voter that returned it and are, according to the state's voter registration, entitled to the ballot. It, it varies 
according to the questions that are on the ballot. So if we have hot ticket items, we have a higher voter turnout this last year. So generally our voter turnout is between 15 and 25 percent. And this last year we did have a very large increase in our by mail voters and it was based on the COVID and and we'll see if that trend goes. Um, generally, we're steady, even keel around 50 absentee by mail voters and right around 100 to 200 absentee in person. And then, so we'll see if last year's trend carries through again this year. That is correct. All right. So there's no further questions. Thank you, everybody, for your time.